Hello, and welcome back to the Sustainable Brown Girl podcast. This show exists to connect Black, Brown, and Indigenous women who are interested in sustainability. Our goal is to inspire, encourage, and educate each other. From gardening, to thrifting, to minimalism, to veganism, and everywhere in between. We are all on a journey to taking care of our bodies and our planet. I'm your host, Ariel Green. In the last 20 years, fast fashion brands such as Forever 21, Zara, and Fashion Nova, just to name a few, have become popular for offering trendy clothing for a cheap price. The true cost of these clothes created for short-term use are being paid by the exploitation of black and brown women and children around the world and of course imposes negative environmental impacts. One of the first and probably easiest steps for many people who are transitioning to a more sustainable lifestyle is to quit fast fashion and start thrifting or shopping secondhand. In today's episode of Sustainable Brown Girl, we talk to Tyler Chanel, an ethical fashion model and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Thrifts and Tangles, which focuses on thrift shopping, natural hair, and sustainability. As a longtime thrifter, Tyler shares tips on how to navigate thrift stores and the importance of shopping ethical fashion brands. Thank you so much for joining us, Tyler. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today and to talk about these topics with you. Yay. So let's just jump into it. The first question I have is, How did you get started on your sustainability journey? Okay, so I got started on my sustainability journey. Let me first of all say my mom is like the thrifting queen. Like she has been trying to get me to thrift since like, I remember being like five years old and going to Goodwill and I was not interested in buying anything or like eight years old, whatever, in elementary school. And we'd always go to Goodwill and I'm like, you know, my favorite store back then was Ross. And I'm like, can we just go to Ross? Why are we at Goodwill? <laughs> um, and so she just always was, you know, she was very frugal. She loved garage sales and just all that thing. I, I did go to garage sales with her as a kid and I really enjoyed those. So she introduced that really early on um, in my life. But um, it wasn't until I think it was my senior year of high school, um, a Savers thrift store opened up down the street from our house. And that was just my mom and I's favorite activity to do together. We would go to the thrift store like once a week. My aunt would come with us and we would just have such a fun time shopping and, you know, buying things secondhand. And like at the end, we'd show each other what we bought. And it was just a really fun bonding time. And it was a great way to like be more sustainable. But yeah, during that time, um, I didn't even realize about, I didn't realize anything about like the sustainable aspect of it. I was just shopping there because it was way less expensive than me going to the mall. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I was getting way more compliments from the outfits I was getting at the thrift store than for like, they were like $5 outfits versus like the $50 I was spending on an outfit at the mall. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start thrifting. Um, This is my thing now. Um, But I watched the documentary, The True Cost, and I feel like that's in everyone's story who kind of changes from um, being um, shopping fast fashion to becoming ethical. But that documentary really opened my eyes to the fact that the fashion industry is just, it has such a negative impact on people and the planet. And as a consumer, I felt like I could make that simple change to stop shopping fast fashion because even in high school and like beginning of college, I would still, I I mostly bought things from the thrift store, but I would still buy like socks from H&M if I needed socks or like little things I didn't want to get from the thrift store. Like I would buy underwear from H&M. So after Mm -hmm. watching that documentary, I said, I'm only, I'm a hundred percent getting everything from the thrift store. And then well, 90% getting everything from the thrift store and then underwear and stuff. I'm going to try to find ethical options um, instead from ethical brands. Um, So that was kind of my journey with that. But then my mom and aunt and I had an unhealthy thrifting addiction and our (laughs) one, it's like down from our house, like five minute drive. So it was like, 
once a week to the thrift store, went to twice a week at the thrift store, to three times a week at the thrift store, to, okay, let's go to the thrift store where we're going to hit up like 10 thrift stores in Vegas. And yes. we were buying so much stuff. We were going to the Goodwill Outlets. I don't know. Do you guys have that where you live? The Goodwill Outlet Center? Yeah, there's one here. Oh my goodness. We would go there once a month. I would buy at least 50 pounds of clothes for $10. Wow. And- <laughs> I was, that was my favorite place. So I had all of this stuff, didn't think anything of it. And then I read Marie Kondo's book, um, uh, The Art of Tidying Up. Um, I don't know the exact name, but yeah. um, I read that and she's talking about things should bring you joy and all this stuff. And like, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a monster. Like none of this stuff brings me joy because I was on YouTube and whatnot. I really felt like I had to thrift constantly. I felt like I needed to always have like a thrift haul video because that was my most popular videos. And I felt like I had to shop every month. Um, and I wasn't wearing most of the clothes and that book, like just lit up a light bulb in my head. And I was like, okay, I need to slow my roll. So, um, a lot of the clothes I, I wasn't wearing, I was like, okay, I don't want to send this right back to the thrift store because Mm -hmm. that's just, it's just pointless at that, you know, I, why did I take it from the thrift store to just send it back and then it might end up in landfill. So I started hosting my own clothing swaps in Vegas and I would open them up to the public and all of the stuff, my, my mom and I both realized, okay, we have a problem. So I made my mom declutter. (laughs) I decluttered and we had enough stuff between the two of us where we were able to like fill up all of the racks at our clothing swaps. I was like, no, oh my one, gosh. no one even needs to bring clothes. Like I just want people to take <laughs> like, to get rid of our stuff in a more ethical way. And my mom and I started doing, um, I don't know if my mom did it, but I started doing thrift miss. And I told my friends this year, you're getting a bag of stuff from my closet that I bought from the thrift store that I never wore. And it's catered to your style. And my friends were loving it. Like my friends would come yeah. to my house. It was crazy. My friends would come to my house, take clothes from my house. It was just a problem. So I, that's like my whole rabbit hole <laughs> with sustainability. I went, I, I started with like just doing it because it was inex- or it was inexpensive. And then I realized thrifting is more sustainable if you do it correctly. (laughs) Um, And then through Marie Kondo's book, I realized, okay, I have to be more mindful and like conscious about my purchases. So now I'm currently at the point where I thrift when I need something. um, And I only try to buy what I need. And I'm trying to implement this into more aspects of my life as well, besides just fashion. So that's the the whole (laughs) crazy story. That was great. I loved it. I can totally relate with thrifting with your mom and aunts because my mom and aunts or a couple of my aunts are really into thrifting and garage and garage sales. So like when I was younger, we would go along with them and it was okay until I got to be, you know, like in middle school and stuff. And I'm like, oh, this isn't cool anymore. But around the that was around the time, like in the early 2000s, when Route 21 and Forever 21 were coming out. And it's like, Mm. okay, well, I could buy, you know, like cheap clothes that are still fashionable. And so like you really go into that rabbit hole. Um, And it hasn't been more until recently that I, you know, stopped with the fast fashion, too. But anyway, the clothing swaps. Okay, first of all, how did you set that up? I'm really interested. Um, so the clothing swaps are so fun. Um, the way I set it up is I I worked for a wedding um, venue and an event a wedding and event venue in Vegas, and I had a relationship with the lady who rented out like the rooms. So I rented out one of the rooms, and then I just had it. So I brought in clothing racks, and I had like tables set up, and basically you walk in, and it looked like it was set up like a little store. And so my boyfriend was actually, I had him run like checkout <laughs> in quotes. <laughs> um, and I would, so if you would bring a bag of clothes, let's say you had five items you wanted to swap. You would um, go check in with my boyfriend, give him the items. He would give you five tickets and that would be mm-hmm. like your cash. Um, and then you got to go through the, you know, go through the shop and, you know, you could try on clothes. There was a fitting room set up. Um, there was like snacks and drinks and it was so much fun because you could see people fall in love with the items that you no longer love. And you can have a whole conversation. You can say like, this is how I styled it, you know, and ask them how they plan on wearing it. And it's just so cool to see that like you're extending the life of your clothing and someone who genuinely loves it is going to take it home. Um, And I've had swaps. um, I usually try to have them once a season. And Mm -hmm. it's so cool to me because 
typically the same people come to my swaps, but it's so cool because I'll see an item that came from a swap like two years ago. It'll be at that swap again two years later. And I'm just like, this is awesome. You don't like it anymore, but someone else can take it. And I just, they're so much fun. I love them so much. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So I see a lot of talk about ethical brands on your blog and your Instagram. Can you explain what makes a brand ethical? Sure. So I'm um, ethical for ethical fashion or like ethical brands in general. Ethical is really like an umbrella term and a lot of terms fall under it. Um, so for me personally, I think an item is ethical if they are eco-friendly, meaning they're made out of products that are um, like raw materials that are sustainably sourced um, or they're not making a, a huge negative impact on the planet. Um, there's also fair trade, which means the workers were paid fair wages. Um, they're getting treated fairly. They're getting benefits. Um, and that focuses more so like on the employee's well-being. And then there's sustainability, which is really items that are designed to be long lasting and to have an overall low impact on the planet. And I think that's more of a long term version of eco-friendly, but a lot of them kind of overlap. Um, <laughs> but for me, I really prefer to buy items like an item could be eco-friendly, but it, it could also not be fair trade. So the item can use like materials that are good for the earth, but the workers weren't paid fairly. So for me, an item is truly ethical when it is good for the planet and it's good for the workers as well, or you know, it doesn't negatively impact the people making the items. Yeah, definitely. So how do you normally find out about ethical brands? So with the ethical brands, um, usually what I'll do is I'll just go to Google and look up ethical blank for whatever I'm looking for. But mm. let's say I'm looking for like ethical lingerie. Um, if I'm looking for ethical lingerie, I'll, I'll type that in. But there's a lot of greenwashing going on in the world. So yes. Greenwashing is basically... Yeah, it's 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 really frustrating. <laughs> but um, greenwashing is basically when like brands are pretending to be ethical, and they'll just say they could say on their website because there's, I mean, there's no law against saying it. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> even if it's not true. But um, I'll go to so I type in ethical lingerie, and then at the bottom I'll look for like, an ethics section, and usually the ethical brands are very transparent about where the clothes are made. Like they dive into their factories. They will share if they're um, factories or just their business in general is certified, like the, if the items are cruelty free, if they're fair trade certified, and they dive into a lot of detail on their website, like this information is readily available. And that's usually a good indicator that they're ethical. Um, another way is they have a lot of ethical brand directories that um, people have made, like other bloggers, I have one that I'm working on on my website on thriftsandtangles.com. Um, but there's also a website called The Good Trade, and they pretty much like vetted all the brands for you. So if you're looking for like ethical athleisure, you can go to their website and they kind of have the brands laid out already. But I would always say, of course, do your research yourself. And if you have any questions, you can email the brands directly. And if they are an ethical brand, they'll be able to answer your questions. If you say, who made my clothes? Some of the brands can tell you the exact person's name, how much they were paid, you wow. know, like just give them the whole breakdown, but some brands that are greenwashing will not give like, they might say, Oh yeah, we're ethical, but they won't give you any statistics. And you know, you could tell when they're, when they're lying, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely can tell. And it's always suspicious when the, when brands like H and M try to come up with an ethical line and it's like, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> girl <laughs> yes <laughs> that is a mess that whole thing it's like and it's because sustainability is like the hot trendy topic right now and people want to, like millennials especially they are more conscious um in some of the reports i'm reading about like consumerism um and so brands are like oh you know let's let's make the packaging green and tell them it's eco-friendly <laughs> or tell them mm -hmm. it's compostable and People, people will buy it because they don't know. They think they're trusting the brands and the brands, they know exactly what they're doing. They're just trying to get more money out of us. Yep, exactly. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, really, it's really bad. So I want to shift into your modeling career. Um, 
how I saw on your website that you are modeling for ethical brands. Um, is it safe to assume that you didn't always do that? And if not, what was the transition into um, only work or working with more ethical b- brands? Yes, of course. Um, you are completely right. Yeah, I started when I first started modeling. I started modeling for a boutique in Vegas. I actually worked there um, as a cashier, and then they hired me on as a model. And they were they were definitely like a fast fashion boutique. Um, they had cute clothes, but trendy pieces that weren't really meant to last long. Like you would wear mm-hmm. them for a month or two, and they would get a hole, or you'll wash them and they were shrink. So they weren't they really weren't long lasting and they were kind of catered to like, you know, if you needed a dress one night in Vegas, I'm, you know, buy from us kind of thing. Um, But I modeled for them and they are the reason I even got into modeling. Like they're the reason I started wearing my hair natural, all this stuff. Like, so I, I really love that I did get that opportunity to work with them. Um, because they, when they hired me on as a model, my, I still had a perm, and this is me going on a whole different rant, but that's okay. Yeah, um, I still had a perm, and they really wanted. Um, I guess they wanted more diversity too on their page. Um, but they really wanted me to have my natural hair, and I, I mean, my hair wa- wasn't going to curl because I had it permanently straightened. But they would ask me all the time, like, "Can you come with your hair curled?" And I was like, sure. So I would go home and curl my hair with a curling iron and show up to set. And they were like, no, like we want your natural curly hair. And I was like, what do you mean? My hair is not naturally curly. Like it's it, so they definitely pressured me or pushed me or I don't know, inspired me. I don't know which word to use, but they really were like, we want you to model, but your hair, we really want it curly for you to model for us. So I'm so thankful for them for that. But yeah, so they, I was modeling for their website. They had more fast fashion stuff. Um, I was signed to a few agencies in Las Vegas and I modeled for like uh, a mall in Colorado, like I did a commercial for that. And so the one thing that made me want to transition is um, one of the other girls who worked with me at that boutique as a model, she got signed to a really big agency in LA. And this is ha- this is after I had started working on um, thrifts and tangles and being vocal online about the problems with fast fashion and really inspiring people to um, try shopping secondhand first and sharing that message. And so I'm um, so the girl who got signed, because my dream was to get signed as a model, my dream was to get signed to the same agency she did, if not a similar one. And Mm -hmm. I would see her online, all over Forever 21's website, all over H&M's website, which is an amazing opportunity for her. But I was like, so conflicted because I'm like, okay, my dream is to be a model to get signed with a huge agency like that. But I don't want to be all over Forever 21's website when I'm online telling people don't shop at Forever 21. That just seems hypocritical to me. And it just didn't feel right. And so um, I ended up randomly, um, a photographer who I worked with in Vegas, um, his name's Lucky's Camera. He introduced me to a woman in Vegas who was a jewelry designer and her name is Andrea Benelli's jewelry and she makes ethical jewelry like all of her materials were ethically sourced and her items were handmade and I started hand modeling for her and it was just so cool to be able to talk to someone who actually cared about how the items were created and was really passionate about the her products and you know her whole mission was uh, about ethical living and conscious living. And it was really cool to connect with someone like that. And I wanted to do it on a larger scale because she's just a small maker in Vegas. But oh, I love that I got to work with her. Um, And so I started researching online for ethical modeling agencies because I'm like, there has to be a way where I can still model, but work for brands that are ethical because I'm I'm already doing it. But I was like, there has to be a way they have an agency to connect me with more ethical brands. So um, I, I did a search and I found Role Models Management. They were the only ethical agency that came up. I'm pretty sure like they're like the only ethical agency in the world or something. Like it's wow. ridiculous. <laughs> it's crazy. But one of their models came up. She's a vegan model. And I read an article about her, about how she only wants to work with vegan brands and how I think she talked about her transition and she said because of this agency, she doesn't have to wear fur anymore as a model and like all this stuff. So I was like, okay, I am going to apply for this agency um, and try my luck. So I submitted my photos. They are located in, in Los Angeles and I was still in Vegas at the time. And so 
I applied for the agency. I sent some photos. And the next day they were like, can you come to LA? We want to meet you. So I drove down to LA. I met them. Um, they saw my blog and they were like, we love your blog. We love your mission. We love that you talk about sustainability. And they signed me on the spot, which was amazing. Wow. Um, and- I, I was so excited. I literally, that was like my dream. I was like, oh my goodness. So I'm, um, I really appreciate my agents because I'm um, both of my agents. They care so much about e- like eco-friendly living. And they're very vocal about that on their um, platforms. And they both were models themselves. So they understand what it's like to work for a brand that isn't in value. It isn't in alignment with your values. So they do their best to connect us with brands that also are, focus on, you know, eco-friendly living or veganism or sustainability. And it's, I'm just so grateful to have them as my agents. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. I can't believe you got signed the same day. I know. I, oh my God. I literally was like, is this real life? (laughs) (laughs) I, I went on before I started Thrips and Tangles and I wanted to really be a model. I went to agencies. My boyfriend and I would come to LA like three to four times a year on vacation. But while we were here, I would say, let's go to an agency. And I would go to the big name agencies and they, you walk in, you give them like your pictures and they go in the back room and show your pictures to whoever looks at it. And then they come out and say, no, we don't want you. So I got turned down so many times from other Mm. agencies. So I was, I was used to being told no. And that's kind of, you have to have thick skin as a model because you might not be what they're looking for. Um, but yeah, I was so happy because this is the one that actually mattered to me. This is the one that was ethical and so right. in alignment with everything I was trying to do. So I'm so grateful for them. Yeah, that's so perfect. I want to go back a minute to you uh, growing out your natural hair. Tell me about that process. Sure. So <laughs> I went down the YouTube rabbit hole, of course. Thank goodness for YouTube. I feel like I wouldn't have been able to go natural <laughs> besides that. <laughs> I am, but so growing up, I always had my hair natural. And then like my mom was really good about caring for my hair and all this stuff. And then in fifth grade, I decided I wanted a perm and she tried to talk me out of it. And I was like, no, I really want a perm. So I got a perm in fifth grade. And then it started being like getting a perm in sixth grade, getting a perm in seventh grade. And I was straightening my hair every single day. Um, mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I want to say it was junior year of high school um, when I was working for uh, that company who wanted me to have my hair curly. I also had a friend who had the most beautiful curly hair. And I've never seen anyone like wear their curly hair like in high school and like wear it proud. And everyone just had their hair straightened or had it like you know, up and tucked away or had braids or something. Like I've never saw it actually out and curly. And so I told myself, I'm not going to get a perm again. I think I got my last perm. It must have been junior year um, because that's when they were like, we want your hair curly. And I was like, it won't curl. I have a perm. <laughs> um, so um, I started slowly cutting my hair off, like um, slowly transitioning. And I would just cut the ends off until it started to look um you know, healthy because they were, it, they were so damaged. They were like permanently straight and you can't revive a curl after that. So during my transition, I did not like how my hair looked curly at all. Um, and so I would just wear it in a bun every single day and pop a headband on it <laughs> and say, you know, that's, you know, that's it. I look cute. Like I'm not going to wear this out ever. Um, and I actually modeled for a Paul Mitchell hair show and they dyed my hair hot pink um, <gasps> they style, yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. It was like, I, it was like hot pink highlights, but they styled it for, it was for the curly line and the stylist styled it in a way that looked so cool. So even though my hair was still damaged, the products they used, it made my hair like kind of come to life. And I was able to see, okay, my hair can be cute curly. I just have to know what products to use and wait for the transition to, you know, happen. And so I literally would take pictures every week of my hair and so I could see the product progress and I would send it to my friend. I'm like, you're my accountability partner. I'm not going to straighten my hair or I'm going to get through this. And when I see the pictures, like now looking back my hair, I'm just so happy I did that because otherwise I would have given up because I did, my hair was so damaged and seeing the little bit of progress between like month one to month four, you could tell it was getting way healthier. So having those photos were definitely my saving grace. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. 
I saw on your blog that you tried a shampoo bar. How, how did that go? Because I'm looking for one. Yeah. So I used, um, it was by Humby Organics, the shampoo bar. Okay. They sent me this product and I'm, I was skeptical. I'm like a shampoo, <laughs> you know, the curly girls, the sustainable products are uh, for the hair are uh, <laughs> questionable. Yeah. Right. And so I use the shampoo bar and I mean, shampoo, I don't really, I don't care about shampoo that much. Like sh- any shampoo I've used, I feel like it doesn't make a big difference on my hair. Like it gets my hair clean and that's all that matters to me. Yeah. Um, but they had a conditioner bar that I did not think was going to work. I li- So I used their shampoo bar. I made my hair clean, whatever. I, cl- I washed it out. I used their conditioner bar, rubbed it on my head a little bit. And immediately I had so much slip on my hair. I was like, what? right. I was like, did this little bar just do that? And I was so shocked. I made my boyfriend come and like fill my hair and it, it worked so good. So the first time I used it though, I rinsed it out um, and my hair was a lot frizzier. So the second time I used it, I, I left it as a leave-in and I think it says in the directions that's okay to do, but le- using it as a leave-in was a game changer. I was so impressed with this little product. I'm like, what? <laughs> this actually works? Wow. That's awesome. I'll have to try that out then. Yes, I use the, they have a mango breeze scent that was, it smells really good, but they have other scents too. But um, I think they're sold out right now because of everything going on with coronavirus. Mm. I don't know if she's making them because they're, they're made by, you know, a small maker and I think she makes them by hand, but I was so excited. But I've, I've heard some girls, other curly girls say that they have had good experiences with different conditioner bars. So if you're skeptical about that, give it a try because <laughs> it okay. actually might work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I have been very skeptical, but you've convinced me. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So you said that you, um, you know, have started to kind of cut back on thrifting so much, but I'm wondering what has been your best thrifting find? So my best thrifting find is probably, so I like fashion and stuff for, you know, thrifting clothes and stuff. But when I moved to LA, I needed to decorate my apartment and I wanted to get as many items as I could secondhand. So most of my items are like from Ikea, which is not very ethical, but I needed some cheap items and I'm going to have them for a long time. <laughs> and I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm keeping these items forever. But um, I got a lot of the items from the thrift store. So my best thrift find is probably a home decor find. Um, I have an apartment tour video on my YouTube video that shows it, but I have a Crosley um like leather cased record player that I found at Goodwill and it was $20 and it's so beautiful I love it so much and it actually works I was so happy about it wow that's awesome oh my gosh yeah it was a good find all the all the home decor pieces like one day I went to Savers and they just had everything in my aesthetic like I was like what is going on it was like someone whoever donated their room is exactly my aesthetic. So I bought like all of their pieces, but I bought some really cool paintings. Like I'm really excited about the stuff I was able to thrift. I also thrifted my couch. I got it on OfferUp. Um, and I got it for, it's a sleeper couch. It was a hundred dollars and couches are expensive. So I was really excited about that. So it's probably a tie between my record player and my couch. Yes. Have you noticed the difference between the thrift stores in Las Vegas and the ones in Los Angeles? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the thrift stores in LA have a much larger selection and it's just because their population is larger. Um, so more people are donating. Um, but Vegas has some really good thrift stores as well. Um, I feel like the thrift stores are both really good, but LA's prices are a little more expensive at certain stores like Goodwill in Vegas. Um, they individually price the items and, um, like for a dress, it might be $5 to $10 or whatever. And in LA, the Goodwill's price by item type. So all dresses are $10, even if they mm-hmm. are, you know, a lower quality dress. So that's one thing that's I've noticed is really different. But um, LA has such amazing thrift stores and they still have thrift stores. Like the prices aren't crazy. Like they have some thrift stores where you can get stuff for like a dollar in LA. And I talked to someone recently who was so shocked by that. She thought because it's in the city, it would be way more expensive, but LA has some really affordable thrift stores as well. That's good to know. 
So, you know, even though I said earlier that I uh, have been going to thrift stores for since childhood, I still feel overwhelmed. And that may be partly because I don't really like shopping in general. Mm -hmm. But what tips can you give to people who are new to thrifting? So the first thing I'll say is if you don't like really, if you really don't like shopping in general, they do have online thrift stores that might make it a little bit less stressful for you because you can actually actually search for that particular item you want. So I would suggest maybe like shopping on ThreadUp or they have Goodwill Marketplace where you can buy items. Um, okay. But my next tip, my next tip would be to know your style. So before you buy a single thing, create a Pinterest board and pin, like, you know, go down the rabbit hole of Pinterest of different different outfits and save everything that you think is cute and then analyze your Pinterest board and see, okay, what item, what do these items have in common and kind of develop your style from there. And once you know your style, it makes it so much easier to go thrifting because you don't have to, my next tip and like same going off the same point is don't dig through the racks at the thrift store you want to like slowly walk down the aisles and just like keep an eye out for something that matches your style. If it's like color or texture, if you slowly, if you slowly walk down the aisles, you can kind of eyeball, like I like stripes. So if I see something striped, I just slowly walk and I'm like, okay, that has stripes. So I'll grab it. So don't, don't tire yourself out. Don't feel like you have to dig through everything. Just kind of, you know, you can kind of have an eyeball of like, okay, this is my style. This is what I like. Um, I would say focus on one section at a time when you walk in. There's so many clothes. So um, really just conquer one section at a time. Like if you're going there for a dress, you know, focus on the dresses. Or if you, I guess another point would be like kind of have an idea of what you want to get. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Because that makes it easier if you can kind of conquer only what you're focused on buying. Like if you want shoes, just go to the shoes. Um. Another tip is to grab anything cute um, that catches your eye and put it in your cart. So if you're slowly walking down the racks and you see something and you pick it up and you're not sure about it, just throw it in your cart and you can figure it out later if you want it. But you never want to grab an item and put it back and then later on be like, oh, I want that item. And then you go back for it and it's gone or you don't know where you put it and (laughs) running around. Um, And then my last tip would be um, to remember that it's okay if you don't find anything, um, some days are a hit or miss. I know some people get overwhelmed and uh, get really discouraged because maybe they go on one to two thrift trips and they find nothing. But even as like a thrift expert, <laughs> I'll go and I'll leave empty handed. Like it's some days they just don't have anything, but that doesn't mean they'll never have something. Yeah. Those are awesome tips. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Good luck thrifting. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) So my last question, or one of the last questions I have, Tyler, is what is one simple step that anyone can take to be more sustainable? One simple step that um, people can take um, to be more sustainable is use what you already own. Um, Find different ways to use it. Maybe upcycle the item. Um, But I think online, there's a lot of messaging about, you know, buy this bamboo set of this, buy bamboo this. And it's, I fell down that rabbit hole. So like, I saw something about bamboo utensils. And I was like, okay, I need bamboo utensils. So I bought them. And I realized I didn't like them. And then later, I realized I could have just used the silverware I own and took that with me and not had I wouldn't have had to spend any money. (laughs) So the most sustainable thing you can do at all is you know, utilize what you already own. And if you have, like, let's say you have plastic utensils or plastic bags, you could do, you could wash those and reuse those, right? Like, there's so many things you could do that will save you money. um, And it is sustainable. But I feel like the larger, like mainstream sustainability movement doesn't necessarily acknowledge those things. Um, But yeah, the most sustainable thing you can do is not buy anything new and just use what you have. Um, I, I would also say, If you do need to buy something, try to go to your thrift store first um, because the thrift stores have a ton of stuff. Like if you need a reusable water bottle, you can probably get one at the thrift store that's really nice for like two bucks. (laughs) So that's true. Right? (laughs) So that would be my other tip. Yeah, that's awesome. I've seen so many water bottles brand new at the thrift store. So Mm -hmm. totally agree. (laughs) All right. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. Where can everybody find you? 
Um, you guys can find me at thriftsandtangles.com. Um, that is my main blog, but I'm also on YouTube under Thrifts and Tangles. I'm on Instagram, Thrifts and Tangles, and then I'm on Pinterest as well, and it's Thrifts in Tangles, like the letter N. Yay. Thanks so much, Tyler. Everybody, please go follow her. She has the best content. Thanks so much for joining us, Tyler. We really learned a lot from your insight. And uh, please go follow her on YouTube and Instagram and her blog. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this Sustainable Brown Girl podcast. Be sure to subscribe and share it if you loved it and leave a review. You can find us on Instagram at Sustainable Brown Girl and check out our Facebook community. We would love to have you there. Until next time, let's continue to make healthy choices for the health of our planet and the health of our bodies. Thanks for listening.